Happy Easter. We are so glad that you are here. Welcome to Resurrection. I'm Ashley Morgenkirk. I'm our online community pastor. My name is Scott Crosstech. I'm one of the pastors here. It is great to be able to spend Easter weekend with you. This is like the most joyful day of the year. I mean, I'm wearing bunny ears. This is a great day. I'm wearing a whole bunny on my head. (laughs) Yes, you are. A whole bunny with its own ears. Yeah. Which is so great. Anyway, We are excited to enjoy and celebrate Easter with you today. We're really excited that you're here. And so we wanna invite you, if this is your very first time here, we wanna go to core.org slash next. Mm -hmm. It's a website. Best one in the world. It is the best in the entire earth. And you're gonna hit, I'm new. It's a little button that says I'm new. We would love to celebrate that you are with us here today. And then if you're here all the time, just go to core.org slash next as well and click tell us you're here. We want to also record mm-hmm. Pretty much we're together. Pretty much just go to that website no matter who you are. That's it's right. A, it's a great experience to find next steps in your life of faith and to connect with us it is. In, uh, in building Christian community. You're going to find all sorts of things there, but there's several things that we want to highlight this Easter weekend, things that are coming up that we want to draw your attention to, and the first of which has to do with Vacation Bible Camp. And I call that the best week of the summer. This is a great immersive experience for all of our kids, elementary school age, to have uh, an opportunity to build community, to make friendships, and to really experience the best part of a life of faith. And we put together a little video. I'm a little biased about this video because my son, Freddie, uh, who's eight, he's the narrator of this video, but it paints a picture of what BBC Week looks like at all of our locations. Let's take a look. The Jesus Tour Do Unto Others Vacation Bible Camp is coming this summer. Don't miss the most amazing week filled with fun games, songs, and crafts, and making new friends. We will make memories together that will last a lifetime, and we will learn how to follow Jesus. You can sign up now, so get ready for the 2024 Jesus Tour coming to all six Resurrection locations. Register now at resurrection.church slash kids. As you can see, this is going to be an amazing uh, week. We want you to be there. We want you to invite your kids to be present or grandkids to be present or neighbor kids or any kid that you know. You don't want them to miss out on this great week of the summer. And uh, to find out more information, you can go to the best website in the world. Go to core.org slash next. You can register, you can sign up, and you can learn more about it there. It's going to be incredible. It is. I'm excited for it. That video got me out. Yeah. So I hope you're a part of it. Um, I also want to share with you what's coming up. We have an author and really a, sort of a modern theologian. He's known oh, yeah. for this. Um, he is a note, noteworthy author who's coming to speak with us on May the 4th. So you can spend the morning, whether in person or online, with Philip Yancey mm-hmm. and kind of hear from him about what I think are really important topics. So we're going to talk about the hard stuff and the good stuff and kind of everything in between. So how can you remember, I wonder, that it's going to be on May 4th? There's all sorts of ways to do it. But if you're a Star Wars fan, there's one way uh, to remember this date. May the 4th be Be, with you. Be with you, yes. And maybe may you be with us on the 4th. Yes, for sure, because Philip Yancey is great. He's awesome. Uh, he's a note where over 15 million copies of his books have been sold. One of the books that really spoke to me was What's So Amazing About Grace. Yeah. And uh, I read that before I was a part of the church. And uh, and there's all sorts of things. But his newest book that he's going to be speaking to us about, it talks about like his tumultuous upbringing, hmm. which yeah. was uh, kind of painful, largely because of like the, the environment he grew up in and the church environment he grew up in. This will be a really relevant, uh, meaningful weekend. And uh, we want you to be a part of it. He's also talking about culture wars. Yeah. Um, there, there are several topics that he's going to cover, but they're important things that mm-hmm. we wish we talked about more, right? Absolutely. And I think we do a good job of talking about the hard stuff yeah. at Resurrection, but he will be a, kind of a fresh voice for us to hear from. So it'll be great. That's right. It'll be awesome. So that's that's coming up May 4th and the 5th. And you can find out more information at core.org slash next. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Really, the last thing that we want to lift up with you and for you is is something that we're going to be kicking off unofficially like right now, but really gearing up for come October. And that's our Do Unto Others kindness campaign. And each year during a, a national election this year, we have the presidential election. We try to run a counter campaign and not counter against, but counter uh, like underneath the presidential campaign. And it's a campaign of kindness. This is one of those years where it seems as though things are polarized and and there's us and them, and there's two opposing parties, and there needs to be a winner. What we want to do is we want to 
move through the middle. We want to draw people together instead of push people further apart. And, and we're going to do that by really unveiling this kindness campaign that focuses in on the golden rule, do unto others, and, and as a way for us to live that out practically. And one of the first ways that you can do that is by joining us in this campaign. Uh, starting today or this weekend, uh, our t-shirts go on sale and you can you might as well show the t-shirt. Um, you can go online, core.org slash next. You can uh, order your t-shirt. You can begin to wear this do unto others kindness campaign, uh, you know, representation or sign or, or witness. And uh, and this is going to be a movement we anticipate that will go all across the country, even maybe internationally, but really focus more here uh, during this uh, national election uh, year. And so we would love for you to participate. You can find out uh, sizes and and, and ranges for the whole family. And uh, it's so cool. There's even like, I think baby sizes, which is kind of fun. And so That's amazing. So the whole there family. There are different colors, yeah, different, different colors. placement of the heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have all sorts of resources that you can find to be a part of this. But in October, we're gonna have a big public campaign, but this is the beginning of that starting this weekend. We would love for you to join us in that. Uh, find out more information at core.org slash next. It's time. It's time. We're here for the joy. We're here for the good news today that guides our faith. It's in our name yeah. of the resurrection today. So let's head into worship as we celebrate that.
Welcome to the Church of the Resurrection on this Easter day. We are so glad that you're joining us for worship. It's gonna be a powerful service. As we prepare for worship, I'd like to invite you to go to God in prayer with me. Would you put your hands on your lap like this and let's just pray together. God, thank you for Easter. Thank you for this day. Pour out your spirit upon us and help us to find in the Easter story hope. In Jesus' name, amen. We wanna begin by reading the Easter story as found in the earliest gospel written, the Gospel of Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But then when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen, he is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee and there you will see him just as he told you.
Christmas Eve, after telling the Christmas story, we light the Christ candle, this very candle. We remember that Christ is the light of the world. And then we sing Silent Night and Joy to the World. And we take our light into the world to push back the darkness. The last weekend on Palm Sunday, we ended the service in silence as we extinguished the candle. We remember that Christ was crucified, dead and buried. His life was ended and we shrouded this candle in the shroud. But as we gather together today, we remember that was not the end of the story. We remove the shroud and we remember the rest of the story. And we share together now in the Easter greeting that pastors, priests have led their congregations in for 2000 years. On Easter morning, the priest or pastor will say, Christ is risen and the people respond, he is risen indeed. And, and then a little louder, Christ is risen. And they shout a little louder, he is risen indeed. And then finally at the top of their lungs, Christ is risen and they shout out, he is risen indeed. Wherever you are, I'd like to invite you to join us in this historic Easter greeting. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed.
Easter. My name is Ashley Morgan Kirk, and I'm our online community pastor here at Resurrection. At this time, I invite you to go to God with me in prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, how thankful we are for today. We are so excited to proclaim that Christ has risen indeed. Your life from death reminds us that what we're going through, you can overcome it. So God, we pray on this Easter day that you would strengthen our resolve, inspire us to seek to do your will. God, offer us your vision for what this world should look like so that we can see it as you see it. And at the same time, we ask that you would extend your forgiveness to us today so that we might be able to love and forgive those around us in the same way. God, for all of the ways that we have fallen short, forgive us for what we wish we wouldn't have done or even for the places that we didn't do anything and we could have. So God, we ask that you would hear us now as we pause for a moment of silent confession. Loving God, just as we share our confessions with you, even before that, you set us free. You forgive us. Help us to receive it and help us to live into the future without fear. We pray that you would bind us together to you and each other. Help us to practice kindness towards our neighbors, whoever they may be. Inspire us to embody your justice for the oppressed and the marginalized in our communities. And keep us humble as we seek to build your kingdom just as you would have it one day be in heaven. So now hear us as we pray that promise aloud, praying the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My name is Scott Crossdeck, and I'm one of the pastors here at Resurrection. And as we continue in worship today, I just want to take a quick moment to say once more, Happy Easter. Thanks for joining us today. It just means so much to us that you're here. And our hope is that you'll not only have an encounter with God, but that you'll get connected and be inspired to, to join us at this church in ways that you can live out your life of faith. And one of the ways that you can do that is by taking out your phone and letting us know that you're here. And uh, we would invite you to use your phone to visit core.org slash next. You could also use your phone to scan the QR code that's on the screen. But either way, click tell us you're here and register your attendance. If this happens to be our first time worshiping with us, we want to make sure that you click the I'm new button in the top right hand corner of that screen. And once you've done that, you can register your attendance, and then that will redirect you to core.org slash next, where we just invite you to take a look around. You're going to find all sorts of ways to get plugged into our life, uh, the life of this church. And there are a few things that I want to highlight for you now that you're going to find on core.org slash next, starting with Vacation Bible Camp, or as I like to call it, the best week of the summer. To give you a glimpse of Vacation Bible Camp and what this week is like for you and for your kids, how you can get involved, I, we put together just a little video, so let's take a quick look. The Jesus Tour Do Unto Others Vacation Bible Camp is coming this summer. Don't miss the most amazing week filled with fun games, songs, and crafts, and making new friends. We will make memories together that will last a lifetime, and we will learn how to follow Jesus. You can sign up now, so get ready for the 2024 Jesus Tour coming to all six resurrection locations. As you can see, this is going to be an amazing week full of fun and friendship and the love of God. It's going to be a week that you won't want your kids to miss. And so registration is open at core.org slash next, and you can find out more information about Vacation Bible Camp there. A second thing I want to share with you is a very special gathering that's happening on the weekend of May 4th. Philip Yancey is a well-known author whose books have sold more than 15 million copies worldwide. His best-known book, What's So Amazing About Grace, was a book that really spoke to me when I wasn't even a part of 
the church. Philip Yancey is going to be joining us on May 4th, the first weekend of May, to speak on his most recent book, Where the Light Fell. And in this book, he talks about his life, his upbringing, overcoming pain and adversity both inside the church and within his family. He describes a life full of racial hostility and political division and culture wars and, and how God is intertwined with all of it. This is, in his own words, the one book he was put on earth to write. And this is going to be a spectacular opportunity on May 4th from 9 a.m. to noon here at the Leewood location or online for an insightful conversation that you don't want to miss. And so to register for that, to find out more information about Philip Yancey's visit here the first weekend of May, visit core.org slash next. We'd love to have you join us. Lastly, we are so excited to launch at the end of 2024 our kindness campaign, Do Unto Others. This is a year that is full of political divide in the midst of a presidential election, and we are looking forward to launching our own campaign in conjunction with the presidential campaigns that will bring people together instead of further divide them. It's going to be a campaign full of kindness and respect and love. Do unto others or the golden rule is something that we want to live by and to share all around during this election year. And so as you join us, we want to invite you in a very special kind of way to order a Do Unto Others shirt to start the campaign right now. You can view the designs about these t-shirts and learn more about the campaign there by going to core.org slash next. We would love to have you join us in this kindness campaign. And now with all of that, let's continue in Easter worship. My name is Cheryl Jefferson Bell, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Resurrection. And as we continue in worship, I invite you to hear these words of Scripture. Our first passage today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I passed on to you as most important what I also received. Christ died for our sins in line with the Scriptures. He was buried and He rose on the third day in line with the Scriptures. He appeared to Peter then to the 12, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at once. Most of them are still alive to this day, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me. When this perishable body puts on imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And from Colossians chapter three. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of scripture. St. Paul is credited with writing 13 letters, the earliest documents of the New Testament. He penned some of the Bible's most powerful words and also a few of its most confusing. Paul's letters had a profound impact on Christian theology and faith, and they continue to speak to us today. The significance of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is revealed to us through the gospel according to Paul. Over the last six weeks, we've been studying Paul's letters here at Church of the Resurrection during the season of Lent. Paul writes the earliest documents of the New Testament before the gospels were written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Paul had already died. So what we have in Paul's 13 letters are the earliest strata of the Christian faith. So we were looking for the gospel according to Paul. Last week, we talked about what Paul said about the crucifixion of Christ. And today we're gonna talk about what Paul said about the resurrection. And his account of the resurrection is the earliest account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that exists in the world. And so we're gonna be focusing on what Paul teaches us about the meaning of the resurrection, what happened, the meaning of it, and what it might mean for us. Before we go there though, I wanna teach you about Eugene Peterson or introduce you to him. Eugene Peterson was a Presbyterian pastor for 29 years in Maryland. Uh, and, and following that, he had, did a stint as a seminary professor. And during that time, he began translating the Bible from the original languages into English in a modern translation that was a bit of a paraphrase. And that was called The Message. Maybe you have a copy of this. I have several copies of The Message and use it from time to time. And it is a wonderful paraphrase of what we have putting into modern English what the biblical authors were trying to say. 
Now, Peterson, uh, after that, uh, producing the uh, message, uh, finally was uh, published in 20, 2002. That book went on to sell about 20 million copies. He also wrote 30 other books that sold millions of copies as well and had a profound impact on many people's lives. So as we think about uh, Eugene Peterson, one of the things that he said in one of his Easter sermons that I really appreciated, I was reading one of them this last week, is he said that we stand at a resurrection triangle. We stand at the corner of a resurrection triangle. And and I'll just give you an image of that quite literally. He said that we have resurrection past, that is Jesus' physical resurrection from the grave. Then we have resurrection future, which is our own resurrection from the dead. And then we have resurrection present. That is how we live the resurrection today. And that really forms the outline of today's message, Easter past, Easter future, Easter present, and how those affect our lives. All right, so I want to begin with the Apostle Paul and his earliest account, the earliest account we have of Easter, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So I want you to listen once more to these words from Paul. I passed on to you as most important what I also received. Christ died for our sins in line with with the scriptures. He was buried and he rose on the third day in line with the scriptures. He appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the 12, the other disciples. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at once. Most of them are still alive to this day. In essence, he's saying, go ask them. You can talk to them. They saw him alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, that is the brother of the Lord, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me. In one translation, it says, he appeared to me as one untimely born. I want you to understand what Paul's saying here by describing the 500 people who saw him and all the other people who saw him. He's saying this is a historical fact that once in all the history of the world, God raised someone from the dead. Now, it wasn't like, Jesus in the gospels resurrects three different people. But this wasn't just a resuscitation. It wasn't just a sort of bringing somebody back who just died in their same bodies. In this case, God raised Jesus and gave him a resurrection body. So uh, it's interesting in Matthew's gospel, we find that the tomb, that the, when the women arrive at the tomb on Easter morning, the stone is still there. Jesus had already, had already left the tomb. So he, he passes out of the tomb while the stone is still there. He has a resurrection body. He can, uh, he can appear to his disciples and they can see his wounds. He can eat with them, but other times he looks like a stranger or he looks like the gardener. And so Christ has been transformed. He has his resurrection body. He has been resurrected from the dead. God raised him from the dead. Only this time in history has this happened. So Paul says this. He says he was publicly identified as God's son with power through his resurrection from the dead. The resurrection was God's vindication of Jesus. Jesus suffered and died. He was tortured to death and he died. He was buried, but God raised him from the dead. And here's what we learned last week is the cross was, a, was God's word to the world, speaking to us about redemption. The resurrection of Jesus was God saying to the world something really clear, that evil and hate and sin and death and tragedy and pain and brokenness and darkness do not have the final word. That was the message of Easter. That's what Christ's resurrection was saying. And God intentionally wants this moment, Christ's resurrection in the past, to influence all the rest of human history. And this is why we say often here at Resurrection that because of Easter, the worst thing is never the last thing. That God has been definitive. There is, there's, he, he's been very clear that no matter how dark things are, the darkness will not overcome the light. And the worst thing isn't the last thing. All right, so how would you face death? The challenges and adversity of life, the struggles and, the, and, and, and all of the pain that happens in life. How would you face life, your daily life, if you knew that the worst thing was never the last thing? If you knew that the light could not be conquered by the darkness, if you knew that somehow in the end, God was gonna redeem everything, how would you live your life? How would things be different if you knew that we would always in the end, God would always in the end be victorious over anything else that comes? I think about the world we live in and the fears we have around politics or or what happens around the world and and, and terrorism and and violence and, and bloodshed, all of these things. But what happens when we look at all of those and we say, we're supposed to get involved and engage in making the world a better place, but we know that no matter how dark things are, the darkness does not get to have the final word. How do we live differently? And the way we live differently is we live as people who have hope. I wanna give you a silly illustration about this, but you know, when, when you live knowing that everything's gonna work out okay, it's way different. So uh, we took our granddaughter, Stella, uh, for her 10th birthday to Branson, Missouri. And uh, it was a spring break and we, we had four nights with her in Branson. We went to Silver Dollar City one day. We got there early in the morning. Here's a picture of Levon and me and Stella sitting in this giant rocking chair as you step into Silver Dollar City. And, uh, and then we went to start riding rides. And in the afternoon, I said, hey, but hey, Stella, let's ride a roller coaster. Now she's a little 
anxious about roller coasters. I said, let's ride a roller coaster. And she said, well, will you sit next to me? I said, of course. So, uh, so we get in line for the TNT, the Thunder Nation. And, and here we are in line at this roller coaster, a wooden roller coaster. So she's you know, willing to get on and we're smiling when we get on the, on the carts and, and then we start taking off and she's a little scared. She's got a hold of my hand. She's got a hold, you know, holding it real tight. And then we're each holding the bar with our other hand. I've got her, my left hand has her right hand. We're holding out of the bar with the outside hands. And, and we do it okay. I mean, we're, we scream a little bit and we shout when we're going around some of the curves and going really fast. But then we come to that giant hill. You know, the kind of hill I'm talking about, like what you see in this, in this video here. We start climbing this hill. And as we're climbing the hill, I look over at her and there are tears welling up in her eyes. If she could have jumped off the roller coaster at that moment, she would have. She is terrified. I'm thinking, what a bad papa I am. My little granddaughter's terrified. I'm like, Stella, breathe. It's okay. It's okay. This roller coaster is not going to last forever. We're going to make it through. We aren't going to die. She's not sure. She is really, really, really scared. And we get up to the top. And I mean, I've, I've, I've got one hand wrapped around her. I'm holding her as tight as I can. Come on, honey, breathe. And, and I'm holding onto the, well, I can't, I can't, can't hold on the bar. I got to, you know, she's got my hand. She's got a death grip on my hand and I'm holding her tight just so she knows we're going to be okay. And we get up to the top of that hill and, you know, you take a little dive and then all of a sudden we're plummeting, plummeting down 66 miles an hour in a, in a near sheer drop off. And we're screaming as we're going down. And then we land at the platform. And when we get to the platform, I look over at her, no tears and a little bit of joy. And I said, well, what'd you think? Do you want to do it again? I want to do it again. I said, what was the scariest part, Stella? And she said, it was going up the hill. That's how life often works. The scariest part is the anticipation of the terrible things that are going to happen. But what happens if you know that you're going to make it through? What happens once you've been through the roller coaster once? And you know, I can survive this. I'm not going to die on the coaster. And somehow it's going to be okay. And my pop is with me and he's got a hold of me and he's not going to let me go. I know it's going to be all right. That changes how you face life. I think about fear and the acronym for fear. You've heard this before, false events appearing real. And there's a lot of scary stuff that happens in this world. But what happens if you know that in the end, the light overcomes the darkness, life overcomes death, love overcomes hate? How do you live? And you live as people who have hope. All right, so that's resurrection past. So then we talk about resurrection future. And when we talk about resurrection future, we're talking about our own death and how we face death. And maybe it's how we face the death of people that we love. And one thing we know, none of us are getting out of this life alive, right? I mean, uh, Paul says that when Christ returns, those who are still alive will be instantaneously transformed. Their bodies will be transformed into a resurrection body. But, but that may or may not happen in our lifetime. And it's been 2000 years. And so, so most of us, we anticipate we're gonna die in this life. We're not gonna get out of this life alive. <clears throat> So we're all going to face death. How do we face death? What does that look like when we're facing death? And as I thought about this, I thought about the number of people that I have cared for as they were approaching death and the families that I've cared for. Being the pastor here for 34 years, I have been with people, I preached the funerals of dozens of people who took their own lives. I have been with families whose children died in, in terrible illnesses or tragedies, teenagers who died in, in automobile accidents. I, I have cared for families in murders and even a murder-suicide. I mean, there's just so many of these kind of tragedies that have happened, young people and, and young adults. And, 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 and looking at all of those, death is just a regular part of ministry. Right, and every week here, we have five or six, sometimes seven or eight people who die in the congregation. And, and, and you know, everybody's lost somebody that they love. We all know the experience of death we're all going to experience grief and we're all going to face death on our own. And so one of the things that the resurrection is about, this is not even the main thing, but one of the things that Christ's resurrection is about is God's word to us that death is not the end, even for you. It's not just that Christ was raised from the dead. It's that you also will be raised from the dead as well. I think about 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, where Paul says this, we know that one, the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus. That is Paul's fundamental understanding of the promise of Christ's uh, crucifixion and resurrection is that because he lives, as Jesus said, we will live also. Now, I've known a lot of people who face death with fear. I mean, even if you're a Christian, there is sometimes an anxiety that comes with the unknown, with what you can't see on the other side. So I've known people who face death with fear and my hope was to bring them some sense of peace. I've known people who face death and they weren't afraid for their own death, but they were grieving the fact that they were saying goodbye to their loved ones. And there was a great grief in that thought. I have known people who, uh, one person I was recently with who had no faith, he was an agnostic, wonderful guy, an agnostic. And he said, you know, I'm not afraid to die. I just, I just think life went by so fast. And what he had was a sort of resignation that this is just gonna happen and there's nothing I can do about it. 
and nothing on the other side of death's door. Well, all of those feelings may be normal feelings. They're, they're a part of, whether you're a Christian or not, it's sometimes we feel resignation about death. Sometimes we feel grief or we feel a great anxiety about death. But here's what the Christian faith and Christ's resurrection brings to our understanding of the future, and that is hope. Christ's resurrection brings hope for us when we think about our own futures. So the apostle Paul says this in, in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, when this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled, death has been swallowed up in victory. What does it look like to face death when you know that death has been swallowed up in victory? I, I think about you know, people who grieve and people who feel anxious and people who are you know, just resignation. And at the same time, there is a sense that there is something on the other side of death's door that there is hope on the other side, that we face death as though there's a great adventure that's gonna begin on the other side. It doesn't mean there's no grief, doesn't mean there's not anxiety or even resignation, but we also think if this is true, if Christ was raised and everything we read in Paul's letters is true, then on the other side is where the adventure really begins. And when we face death that way, it's a whole different ballgame. When we are grieving, when we're preparing for the loss of somebody we love, or we lose a child or somebody, an untimely death, it's horrible, it's a terrible, terrible darkness. But the one mitigating factor, the one little bit of light that pierces the darkness is the idea that death is not the end. I think back, this, I just was sharing with somebody uh, this week, uh, a cousin of mine had passed away and, and his daughter, and I was talking with her and, uh, and we were talking about her dad. And I said, you know, I love how in Isaiah the prophet, in chapter 25, Isaiah says that, that the shroud of death will be destroyed. And that there will be that, that on the other side is a great banquet with the finest of wines and the richest of foods. And, and, and there, there's no more weeping and no more sorrow and no more pain. And, and both Paul and the writer of Revelation pick up on the scripture to describe what happens on the other side of our deaths. That what we find on the other side, I love this imagery, is a party. It's a wedding reception. It's a celebration. All the people that you know and love and care about the most who have already passed on are there with you, celebrating you're in a place of light and life, joy unspeakable and filled with glory. And that's what we look forward to on the other side. So this gives us hope. As we think about Christ's resurrection in the past, it brings hope for our resurrection in the future. So I think about Eugene Peterson's translation in the message of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 14. This is probably Paul's earliest letter written around AD 50. And, uh, and he's writing to a little church that he started and somebody has died in that church. And they were anticipating Christ was coming back at any moment. Now their friend has died and they're experiencing this grief. And this is what Paul says to them. He says in the message version, he says, regarding the question, friends, that has come up about what happens to those already dead and buried. We don't want you in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry on over them like people who have nothing to look forward to as if the grave were the last word. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to life those who died in Jesus. I love this. Now, Peterson, who, who gave us the message, passed away in 2018. By the way, uh, Peterson started when he was working on the message, he started with the book of Psalms and he published that separately. And there was a singer in Ireland, who a rock singer, who got a hold of that, of that translation of the, of the uh, Psalms, and they deeply influenced him. In fact, several of his songs were based upon the words that he found in, uh, in uh, Patterson's trans, Peterson's translation of the Psalms. And, uh, and he reached out to him and he thanked him for this. And, and, uh, and then later on, they kind of struck up a friendship, this younger rock musician and this older biblical scholar. And, and uh, near the end of Eugene Peterson's life, this rock musician uh, asked if he could come visit. Peterson had retired by this point and he was living in Montana and Bono, the lead singer for U2 shows up at his house. And here's a picture of them one afternoon as Peterson's talking about the Psalms and they're talking about music and praise and, and life. And it's just this beautiful, there's a wonderful interview you can watch online of these two talking with each other about the power of the Psalms. Anyway, um, Peterson, when he died, the day after he died, Bono stopped the concert wherever he was with U2 and they dedicated the next song to Eugene Peterson. So as Peterson is approaching death, his family described what they experienced. And this is what they said. Again, this is a man who believed in resurrection past, future, and present. And they said, uh, as they described his last days, they said, his joy, one of them wrote, his joy, my, oh my, the man remained joyful right up to his blessed end, smiling frequently. And we overheard him speaking to people. We can only presume we're welcoming him into paradise. And I love this. They said among his last words were these two, 
Let's go. A great adventure that stands on the other side. Let's go. Hope. That's what we find in resurrection future. All right, that leads to resurrection present. So Peterson picks up on this passage in his Easter sermon some years ago, Colossians 3.1. He, he, uh, Paul writes this, since then you have been raised with Christ. You have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Now, I'd never really thought of this until I read Peterson's sermon, but this idea that Paul's saying, now we know the resurrection happened in the past and we know that it's gonna happen for us in the future. But here Paul's saying, the resurrection has already happened in your life. You have already been raised with Christ. What does that mean? We haven't died yet. How can we have already been raised with Christ? But when we look at this, Paul's talking about what our lives were like before we came to faith in Christ. Maybe you haven't come to faith in Christ yet, but before we come to faith in Christ, and, and the idea is that, that part of us was dead and needed to be resurrected. Part of us was broken and needed to be healed. Part of us was blind and we needed to see. Part of us had a hard heart and we needed a softened heart. Part of us was hopeless and we needed to find hope. Part of us felt loveless and we needed to find love. Christ has already, when you put your faith in him, he's already raised you up. He's already given you a new beginning, a fresh start. You've been transformed by his resurrection today when you believe in it. So the apostle Paul says this in Romans 10, 9, and 10. He says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That is, you say, Jesus is the master, the sovereign, the ruler in my life. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And in your heart, you have faith that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. It's interesting. He doesn't talk about anything else. He just says, confess that Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. The word saved also means delivered. It can be translated delivered, rescued, helped. You're going to find your soul is rescued when you put your faith in Jesus, that God raised him from the dead. You come to believe this, it changes everything. It changed everything for Paul. It changes everything for us. It doesn't make everything perfect. We still go through hardship and adversity and difficulty. We just face it differently when we see it through the lens of the resurrection. Now, when I think about Paul and what he says uh, about the resurrection, that leads to this big theme of hope. Over 60 times in Paul's letters, he talks about hope. I wish I had time to read every one of those passages to you today. I read them all this week. Hope, hope is the result of believing that Jesus was raised from the dead, that God raised him from the dead. And hope changes us. And, and resurrection present is living as people who not only have hope, but who convey hope to other people. We begin to live in this life as though we see what the world is supposed to be like, and we're gonna bring hope and we're gonna help transform the world around us. I was reminded as I was thinking about living with hope of a man named Benjamin Zander. Benjamin Zander is 85 years old and he's still conducting the Boston Symphony. And when he got there, I don't know, three decades ago, the symphony was bleeding red, it was in trouble, and, and you know the, the attendance was down. And, and he came in, he transformed, he turned it upside down. He, he, he revitalized the Boston Symphony. And then he began teaching leadership. He was teaching other symphony conductors how he did it. And I happened to see one of his early leadership lessons and he was talking about the kind of symphony conductors that are out there in the world. And he said, you know, today we recognize that, that only a small percentage of the population listen to classical music. And so that's kind of a downer for a lot of people. A lot of schools are no longer providing great classical music education. He said, you know, it, it, it's easy to get depressed about this and the numbers of attendance, you know, at symphonies are going down. Uh, this is several decades ago. And, and he says, so there's two kinds of symphony conductors. And I want to show those to you. He, he says there are two kinds. Uh, one of those are downward spiral thinkers. They're people who always see the, the glass as three quarters empty. They're people who complain and lament. And, they, and you know, it feels good to complain sometimes. We all want to complain sometimes. And they're the ones who are saying, you know, look, the schools don't provide a good education. And what's wrong with all these people listening to rock and roll music? And, and you know, it's terrible and woe is me. And we have no future in our industry. And, and he says, you know, those kind of folks, people like to get together and they like to complain. But he said they never change anything. They never transform anything or make it better because they're just too busy complaining and seeing the world and the symphony world as three quarters empty. So he said, but there's another kind of symphony conductor and those kind of symph symphony conductors, they see the same circumstances, but they radiate possibility. They see all the ways in which things could be better. They say the same circumstances. They, they, they look and they say, you know, of course, attendance is down in symphonies and only 3% of the population listen to classical music. But then they say, well, only 3%. That means we have a 97% untapped market share. People listening to rock and roll music. Well, let's do a pop series and let's combine rock and roll with the symphony. If people don't get good education at the schools and the schools don't have money to hire, you know, teachers, well, let's volunteer as a symphony to work in the schools. What can we do to see an opportunity 
where others only see adversity. I want to ask you a question. And I don't mean this by any, you know, we're all kind of wired differently. I think genetically we're wired differently. Some of us by nature radiate possibilities. Some of us by nature see the glasses three quarters empty and, and, and you know, we have this sort of spiral of, of lament and complaint. Which are you most like? And what I want to encourage you in, you may not be able to change your genetics, your DNA. What you can change is inviting God to help you remember the resurrection every day. Like there is always hope that there is nothing that can't be overcome with the presence and power of Christ, if not in this life, in the next life. So I think about these words of the Apostle Paul. He he captures this this way. He thinks about life this way. So one of the most famous verses of Paul, Romans 8, 28, in all things, God works together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. What a powerful passage. It's sometimes quoted tritely, but really, no matter what happens, God doesn't cause everything to happen that happens. He doesn't cause all this suffering and terrible things. But put in God's hands, God has the capacity to force or bend something good, to wring something good out of the suffering of the tragedy, the pain in this world. God does that and he does it through us. I love what Paul says later in that same chapter. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Not suffering, not pain, not adversity. Nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus, our risen Lord. And I love in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, when Paul's describing his own adversity. So Paul had been arrested multiple times. He had been beaten with rods. He had been shipwrecked. He had been, he had been uh, abused by his, you know, uh, hurt by his, you know, his uh, fellow Jews. He had been chased down by the Romans. He, he ultimately would be beheaded for his faith. And this is what he says in, in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, he says, we are hard pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned, We are struck down, but not destroyed. What's he saying? He's saying that because of the resurrection and this resurrection faith we have, no matter how hard things may seem, God continues to sustain us and our faith sustains us. And we always have hope. We're called to live our lives as people of hope. We're called to be resurrection people. And not only to have hope for ourselves, but to give hope to other people. Like imagine the joy of every day looking to see how can I bring hope to someone else by listening, by caring, by helping. How can I give hope to somebody else? That's what we're meant to do as people of the resurrection, as Easter people. I'm reminded of the story of Shane Stanford. Shane is, uh, he's a United Methodist pastor, a colleague. Uh, I first heard his story, I think I first met him and got to know him and hear his story probably 25 years ago. I wanna share it with you. This is a picture of Shane, a really great guy. Uh, he's a uh, United Methodist pastor. He's an author. He's an inspirational speaker. Anyway, his story, as the story I want to share with you, begins when he's a little kid and he is diagnosed with hemophilia. And so as a kid, he has to get blood transfusions. By the time he's 16 years old, he's received a blood transfusion. This is in the late 80s. He's received a blood transfusion that was tainted with HIV. And he receives a diagnosis at a time when a diagnosis of HIV was a, was a death sentence for most people. And he's told as a 16-year-old, you have HIV, but we don't know how long you're going to live. Now, his parents were divorced, and the father figure in his life was really his grandfather. And he and his grandfather went out after he received this diagnosis. They went up to this hillside, and they looked down on the valley below, and, and they just sat there in silence. And he says, finally, my grandfather looked over at me and said, so what are you going to do with this thing? He said he wouldn't even call it by the letters. He couldn't say AIDS or HIV. He just says, what are you going to do with this thing? I looked over at my grandfather and said, I don't think I have a choice. There's really not much I can do. And my grandfather was such a sweet spirited man. But when he said things that he wanted you to remember, he said it in a tone of voice that you knew these words were important. And he looked at me and said, son, you always have a choice. He said, now you can get in the corner and you can feel sorry for yourself. And he said, you know how much I love you and I'm gonna sit in the corner with you and we'll have a pity party together if that's what you choose. He said, but I think you're gonna choose a better way. I think you're gonna choose to make every day count. He said, no matter how many days you have, every day's gonna matter. And he said, I can remember leaving that hillside thinking, that's what I want. I want every day to count. You see, Shane's grandfather gave him hope that day. He he didn't, you know, give him some Pollyanna answer. He just gave him hope that however many days you have, you can make it count. And that's what Shane did. And as he grew up, he decided God was calling him to be a pastor. And he went to seminary. He became a United Methodist pastor. He wrote a book called Living Positive, uh, a play on the words of being diagnosed positive with HIV, but then living positive in the rest of his life. 
And he became an inspiration to tens of thousands of people and a instrument of God's desire to bring hope to other people. If that can happen with Shane, what can God do with you as we seek to be instruments of hope? All right. So in our daily lives, this is a daily part of our mission. How do we love people? That's bringing hope. How do we listen to people? How do we care for people who are working who are in crisis? How do we help people who are in need? That's all part of living as resurrection people, as Easter people in the present. All right. So I want to remind you every year at Easter, we, we decide, you know, what can we do as a congregation with thousands of people coming in Easter? What can we do to bring Easter hope, to bring resurrection to communities that are in crisis or people who are in trouble here in Kansas City and beyond? So we do this at Christmas Eve. At Easter, we give a $200,000 grant. The first $200,000 that comes in the offering is going towards this grant. So this year, as we, as we solicited uh, grant applications, one rose to the surface, rose to the top, and that was the Kansas City, Missouri public school system has a program. It's, uh, it's in part funded by the federal government, but then they have parts of it that are not funded by the government or taxpayers, and this is to help homeless students. So not far, 20 minutes from our location where I'm standing right now, there are kids who are homeless. These are families who are living out of their cars for a period of time. These are people who are moving from house to house to house and have no steady place to live and no steady address that they're gonna be at. And these children often are left behind when it comes to school. They, they, can't, they can't go to school here and then go there and then go there. Often these kids end up uh, way behind when it comes to school and in an even deeper ditch than they were in before. And so uh, the McKinney-Vento Act of the federal government is aimed at trying to make sure these kids can stay in school. <clears throat> so the grant was a request that came through Restart and the Kansas City, Missouri Public Schools asking for funds <clears throat> to help provide the finance, to meet the financial needs, not only of the children, <clears throat> but of their families. And so uh, I wanted you to hear just a little bit more about the attempt we're gonna make at bringing resurrection hope to kids right here in Kansas City. Take a look. Homelessness disrupts education on a couple of different levels. You have your safety and security. It also messes with your social emotional learning. When you have all of these additional traumas that are coming that are coming to you as a child, your brain is already developing. And so how do you internalize that trauma? How do you move past that trauma? You kind of need some help to work through some things. I run our McKinney Vento program which we refer to as our Students in Transition program. And what we do is make sure that we are able to enroll our students into school immediately. We continue to foster great relationships with you know, CORE as well as other partnerships such as Restart so that we can help meet their most immediate needs, which is the housing. Average family may have two to three, sometimes four. So the holistic approach that we take is that we wanna get you enrolled in school and then we sometimes have to maintain the household so that that child isn't worried about that parent and that parent isn't necessarily worried about that child so they both can do what their respective jobs are. So no matter where you came from or what you're struggling with, it takes a village to help you. And that's kind of like what we hear at Restart. One of our young ladies um, said, Christina, I haven't missed any days in two weeks. And she said, and that's a big deal. And I'm starting to make friends. And she said, but I'm starting to understand my math. She was so proud of that. Um, I had asked her, so you didn't have any friends prior to this? She said, I couldn't stay in school long enough. So that's amazing. She's actually growing in school and she has not been missing any days. Because it's not our will be done, but your will be done. And so we're going to tell you that, you know what? You may not have hope, but I got enough hope for the both of us. Just the fact that people have been sleeping outside for months or sleeping in their cars, just to know that they have a bed to sleep, that's just a symbol of hope. I love the comments that Melissa and Christina made at the end. Melissa says, I have enough hope for both of us. And Christina says, when you've been sleeping in your car or outside and you have a chance to have a place to live and go to school, what we do is we bring hope. We're going to bring resurrection to these kids in Kansas City, Missouri Public Schools who are homeless right now. And I'd like to invite you in a few minutes to be able to help with that. That's part of what it looks like to be resurrection people, to bring hope to others. I want to end with this. The, uh, this week, I received a letter from the Bishop of Tanzania and North Congo. And he had reached out a couple of weeks ago, and he said, Adam, we've got a problem. We have a school. There's about 95 kids at the school in Tanzania. And he said, uh, we've got, we lost the sponsorship for that school. The American sponsor 
uh, with, withdrew their sponsorship, and now we have no way to provide for these kids. We got all these kids. We got to feed them. They're staying there in, on site. Then, you know, many of them are orphans. And he said, our aim is to take care of them. He said, we're out of money. We have nothing left to give. Is there any way resurrection could help until we can shore this up? And so we said, well, you know, we have our Easter offering coming up, and we already planned $140,000 for the Kansas City Public Schools, but we hadn't designated the remaining $60,000, and we think we can help. We can immediately provide aid to be able to help, help your kids have enough to eat, to provide the salaries for the teachers, to provide whatever they need, and then we're going to be able to help over the next few months until they can get back on their feet. And as we did that, as we described that, I got this letter. Oh, by the way, here's a couple pictures of these kids at the school. So there's some of the kids at the school. And, uh, and then he sent a close-up of this, uh, this little girl. And these are the kids. These are the actual kids that we're going to be helping with the remainder of that $200,000 grant we're giving. And so I got this letter, and I thought it was just awesome. I needed to share it. It was a thank you to you, knowing what we we're going to do. It says, the bishop said, words cannot fully express the relief I felt when Church of the Resurrection's global mission team informed us on Monday that Resurrection would be stepping in with financial assistance so the school can remain while we develop a sustainable long-term plan. Listen, truly, it was an Easter moment for me. What we thought was dead has been reborn. I want to encourage you to be people who embrace Easter past, who have hope in Easter future, and who live as Easter people in the present. And that leads to my concluding words. I say every year at Easter, people ask me from time to time, do you really believe this stuff? Come on, you're a smart guy. You don't really believe that Jesus died, his body's in the tomb, the stone's there. And, and, and on Sunday, he, he walked out of the tomb you're too smart for that. Surely you don't really believe this idea that when we die, there's something of us that, that continues, that we receive some kind of resurrection body somewhere else. And, and my answer is always the same. I not only believe it, but I'm counting on it. But listen, more than that, I wanna live it. And I want you to, I wanna invite you to live the resurrection too. Let's pray. Why don't you just put your hands on your lap if you feel comfortable doing that, like you're lifting them up to God and why don't you just whisper this prayer. God, I trust in the resurrection. Jesus, I confess that you are Lord, not me. And I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. Rescue me from hopelessness and despair. From the glass is three quarters empty thinking from fear and anxiety and help me to live as a resurrection person, to live as a person with hope, who gives hope. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I'd like to invite you to be a part of this offering. I wanna invite you to be able to give generously to make a difference in the lives of kids right here in Kansas City, in the lives of kids in Tanzania, you can be a part of bringing resurrection, bringing Easter to these kids. So let's give generously. The instructions are on the screen and let's continue to worship the Lord with joy as we move towards the conclusion of our Easter service.
you feel the joy of Easter, the hope of Easter, just as I do today. And as we conclude the service, I want to invite you to be back next week. If you don't have a church family, join us again next week. We're going to spend three weeks talking about what it looks like to restore faith. Maybe you saw the article in the news this last week that talked about how faith is on a decline across America. We're going to look at some of the reasons why. And then we're going to look at what an authentic, meaningful, life-changing faith looks like. We want you to be a part of this. Plan to join us next week. Here's a brief promo for the next series of messages. Take a look. Religion has seen a marked decline in recent years. To some, it feels irrelevant or hopelessly outdated and worn out, like an old piece of furniture to be discarded. What if the problem isn't faith, but the way it's been practiced? What if our faith is simply in need of restoration? In the process, we might find a meaningful, authentic, and compelling faith one that enriches our lives and positively impacts our world. Join us beginning April 6th and 7th for a three-week series of messages as we explore what it might look like to reconstruct and restore our faith. Join us next week as we kick off this important series of messages. Now, I want to invite you to bow for the benediction. Oh Lord, may the resurrection past, future, and present be our hope And may we live as resurrection people, taking hope into the world in Jesus' name, amen.